Welcome back, Robert Breaker here. Turn with me, if you would, to Titus chapter 2. And I'm going to preach on a, a message that I've had on my list of the sermon outlines of things that I wanted to preach. And this has probably been on my list for a good two years at least. This is something I've been wanting to preach on for some time. But you know how it is, you pray and, and God puts something on your heart and you, you preach on something else. And But this is something that uh, I believe is very important, very important for many Christians to know. And so what I'm going to do today, I'm going to preach on grace, not an excuse to sin. And I hope that this will be a blessing to you today. So let's start with Titus chapter 2. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 14. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to all men. So the grace of God brings salvation, and we're, we know that we're saved by grace through faith. But certainly grace has a part in salvation. Have appeared to all men, teaching us. Now what is grace supposed to teach us? Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. So grace is supposed to teach us something. It's supposed to teach us to deny ungodliness and worldly lusts. So it's supposed to teach us that we shouldn't want to do ungodly things and be worldly. It's supposed to teach us to be holy and righteous. And we're supposed to live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Now verse 13 says, Looking for that blessed hope and the glorious appearing of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. That's what we're looking for today, the rapture. Verse 14, Who gave himself for us, that he might redeem us from all iniquity. Amen. Salvation is being redeemed from all iniquity. It's the forgiveness of all trespasses, all sins. And purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. So part of salvation is when you get saved, God wants you to be zealous of good works. And he wants you to be peculiar. He wants you to be different than the world. So the world looks at you and they go, wow, what's, what's, what's up with this guy? He doesn't do this or that or this or the other thing. He doesn't sin like we are. He's not ungodly. What's the deal with that? Oh, it's because I'm saved. I have grace. I've learned what the Bible teaches. And I have salvation. It says here in verse 15, These things speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. Let no man despise thee. Well, isn't that interesting? In the Bible, there's a place where Paul says, This is the thing that I want you to speak and exhort and rebuke with all authority. <laughs> if ever there's anything in the Bible that a man's supposed to preach and teach with all authority, it is this message right here. Grace, not an excuse to sin. But there are some today that say, well, you know, I'm saved by grace. And because I'm saved by grace, well, that means that I can do whatever I want. I've dealt with a lot of people. I've met a lot of people. And they say it this way, and, and it's, kind of, it's kind of scary the way they talk. And I will quote them, but I will, uh, I will take one word that they use, and I will just spell that word out a little differently because I don't want to use the word. But I've heard people that claim to be Christians say this. I'm saved so I can do whatever the H-E double hockey sticks I want. That's H-E-L-L. -L. They say, I'm saved and I can do whatever the H-E-L-L -L that I want. Is that the right attitude? Is that the mentality of Christianity? Is that what a Christian should be like? Hey man, now that I'm saved, I can do whatever sin I want. No, no. Salvation, grace, is not an excuse to sin. God didn't save us to sin. God saves us so that we can serve Him. So I've run across people like this, and it's really bothered me, their attitude. <laughs> that they think, well, now that I'm saved, I can do whatever I want. Well, yes, you can. You can. But the question is, should you? You know, a lot of people don't know the difference between can and should. Just because you can do something does not mean that you should do something. So a lot of people run around and say, well, because I'm saved by grace, then I can do this, and I can do that, and I can commit fornication, and I can live in adultery, and I can steal, and I can lie, and I can cheat, and I can cuss, and I can get drunk, and I can... Just because you can, does that mean you should? Is that a good testimony for a Christian? You can do anything. If I wanted to, I guess I could go rob a bank. I can do that, but I don't want to do that. Number one, that's a sorry excuse for a preacher and a minister. Number two, that's wrong. Number three, I don't want the consequences. I don't want to go to jail. So I will not, even though I could, I should not, and I will not go rob a bank. I don't want to. I want to do right. 
So what is the deal with these people? They claim to be Christians, and yet they want to do wrong. They want to take grace as an excuse to sin. Turn with me, if you will, to Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to read a verse there, but as you're going there, let me define what grace is. I think the easiest way to define grace is, grace is God giving you what you don't deserve. When you get saved by trusting the gospel, you get God's grace. And you get something you don't deserve. You get eternal life. You get forgiveness of your sins. You get a mansion in heaven. You're justified. You, you get God's imputed righteousness. You don't deserve that at all. So part of grace is God giving us what we don't deserve. Salvation. But also grace is God not giving us what we do deserve. What do we deserve? We deserve hell. Everybody deserves hell because they're wicked sinners. But when we get saved, we don't go to hell. Why? Because of grace. God gives us what we don't deserve, but also God does not give us what we do deserve. We deserve hell. So grace is a wonderful thing. And when I look at grace, I say, wow, it makes me want to serve Jesus because I got something I didn't deserve, and I deserve something, and I'm not going to get it. I'm not going to hell because I'm saved. That makes in me this great desire to want to do something for Jesus. Not abuse His grace and say, well, I'm just going to go sin now because I can. I don't understand the thinking of people that think, now that I'm saved, I'll do whatever the H-E double hockey sticks I want. I just, I don't get that. Ephesians chapter 2, I ask you to go to. Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9, are verses that we all know, at least I hope we do. They're verses on salvation. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And we dogmatically scream and holler, and we as preachers, and any kind of a Bible-believing preacher, we say, you know, you're saved by grace through faith. You're saved by grace through faith. And that's true. So salvation is not of works. Salvation is by trusting the finished work of Jesus Christ. But quite often, when we go to Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, we just read Ephesians 2, 8, and 9, and we don't read verse 10. You know what verse 10 says? Verse 9 is very adamant, it's not of works that we're saved. But verse 10 says, For we are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus, unto good works. <laughs> so, we're not saved by our works, but when we get saved, it's implied that now we need to do some good works. Why? Because grace is not an excuse to sin. Because God gives us what we don't deserve and doesn't give us what we do deserve, why we need to work toward Him to show Him the great love that we have for His grace upon us. Let me read the rest of the verse there. Which God had before ordained that we should walk in them. So it says we are created His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So when we're saved, we ought to do right. And we should walk in good works. Because God ordained before, the verse says. So God's ordained that when you get saved, you get saved so that you can serve. Let me write that up here. God wants us to serve Him, not sin. So we are saved to... Release that line there. We are saved to serve, not sin. You get that. But there's this idea within many that claim to be Christians today that, well, now that I'm saved, I can do whatever the H-E double hockey sticks I want. And they think that grace is an excuse to sin, and it's not. If anything, it's a great opportunity and a privilege to serve Jesus Christ. I've got lots of verses today that I want to go to. Go with me to Hebrews chapter 10. And I just want to give you verses and show you that we that are Christians... We ought to do everything we can to live a holy Christian life and serve Jesus Christ. Because that will please Him. And it should be because we are pleased with God's grace. Because God's saving us and giving Him His, our, His grace, because we are pleased, we should serve Him. Not abuse His grace as an excuse for sin. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 29. Look what it says here. Of how much sore punishment suppose ye shall ye be thought worthy, who hath trodden underfoot the Son of God, and hath counted the blood of the covenant, wherewith he was sanctified an unholy thing, and hath done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Now I looked at that word despite, and I thought, what does despite mean? 
And uh, I looked it up, and it, it basically means insult. <laughs> it's saying here that the blood of Jesus Christ is a holy thing. When we get saved, we're washed in the blood. Ephesians 1, 7 says that we have forgiveness of sins and redemption through His blood. So we are made holy, are, are sanctified, are cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ, our soul, and we're saved. So if God died on the cross to make us holy, then the uh, idea is, so live a holy life as a Christian. Not take what God has given us and abuse it and use it as an excuse to sin. And so it says right here that someone has insulted or done despite unto the Spirit of grace. Who would that be? Someone that looked at that and said, well, I'm glad I'm saved and not going to hell. That's great. Now I'm going to go enjoy sin. <laughs> what are they doing? They are insulting God's grace. That's what the, that's what the verse is saying. Now, I'm going to continue reading there. Verse 30, For we know him that hath said, Vengeance belongeth unto me, I will recompense, saith the Lord. And again, the Lord shall judge his people. Verse 31, It is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. Now, I'm going to have to briefly put this up here as quickly as possible, because a lot of people still to this day don't understand salvation. And it's really sad. What takes place when you're saved? Every person that's alive has three parts. Just as God is a triune being, the Godhead, uh, a Bible word is not Trinity, the, the word Trinity is not in the Bible, but the doctrine of the Trinity is called the doc Godhead. God is one God with three parts, body, soul, spirit. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, three parts. 1 Thessalonians 5.23 tells us that we have three parts. In Genesis it's told we're made in God's image, so we have three parts. We have a body, we have a soul, and we have a spirit. When we are saved, the Bible says we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. So what is saved is our soul, and the Bible says that we're washed. So all of those sins that were applied to our soul, those black spots of just filth need that God looked at and saw our own self-righteousness and our sin, that's all washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. When we're saved, God doesn't see us as we are. He doesn't see us as sinners. All He sees is the blood of His Son that covers our sins. He says, that's a believer. I see the blood. So what is saved is the soul and the spirit. And the Bible tells us that the soul and the spirit come together and are melded together as a new creature in Christ. There's a spiritual circumcision that takes place, a cutting of the flesh. And so the body is up here, and the body is not sinless. The body is still sinful. The body is not saved yet. In fact, the body does not get saved until the rapture. The rapture is called the day of redemption. And that is when we get a glorified body. So basically what salvation is, is when you're saved by trusting the gospel, you become a new creature in Christ, and your sins are washed away, and your soul is covered in the blood of Jesus. But you are living in a sinful body. Now with that stated, what we're supposed to do according to the Bible, is walk in the spirit that we fulfill not the lust of the flesh. So we are supposed to be the new man, the new creature, it's also called the new man, and we're supposed to follow the Spirit of God and do what the Holy Spirit would have us to do. That's what we're supposed to do. But many people who are saved, that claim to be Christians, they decide, well I'm saved now, my soul is washed in the blood of Jesus, now my body wants to do this, this, and this, I think I'll just let it. That's the wrong attitude. That's someone that's taking grace as an excuse to sin. What is it that sins? It's the body that sins. It's not the soul inside that sins. A lot of people don't understand the book of 1 John. And rightly so, it's a hard book to understand. Because in 1 John, the Apostle John says, We that are born of God do not commit sin. <laughs> what a thing to say. He said, We that are saved, we don't sin. And yet, you look at people that are saved... And they sin all the time. Well, how could he make a statement that if you're saved, you don't sin? The new creature cannot sin because the soul cannot make the Spirit of God, which is inside, sin. What sins when a Christian sins is the body, not the new creature inside. So that's why the Bible tells us not to grieve the Holy Spirit of God. We're supposed to put reins on our flesh. We're supposed to crucify the flesh. We're supposed to put down the sinful desires of the flesh. We're supposed to walk in the Spirit, in the new man, in the new creature, and not fulfill the desires of the flesh. 
But there are some people that look at salvation and they say, well, now that I'm saved, you know what I'm going to do? Heck, I never did this before. I never did that before. I'm just going to go do all this, and I'm going to go sin and see what it's all about. I'm going to enjoy it. Uh, it's not going to work that way. Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 30. The Bible says, And grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whereby you are sealed until the day of redemption. Grieve not the Holy Spirit. Now, some people try to be um, inspectors, I guess is the word. Some people try to judge whether a person's saved or not. I think that's ridiculous. You can't know if a person's saved or not. But they try to say, well, this guy's saved, this guy's lost, this guy's saved, did you? And you don't know. The way to know if you're saved is this. Have you trusted the gospel? If you've trusted the gospel, then Ephesians 1.13 says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So you're a new creature. You're born again. You are saved. Now, when you sin in your body, there's a grieving that takes place. And the Holy Spirit inside of you grieves when you allow the sinful body to sin. And so what happens is a Christian, when he sins, he feels bad. I had a lot of people contact me that got saved and they're excited. And a guy called me from Japan the other day, excited, just excited about salvation. And all the time I, I hear from people saying, Man, I got saved, I got saved. And then they're like, And you know what? When I when I do a sin, it just feels horrible. I just feel this this ugh inside of me that just goes, Why? Why did you do that? What is that? That's the Holy Spirit inside of a person grieving that they allowed their body to sin. So the Bible says, don't grieve the Holy Spirit. So we're supposed to walk in the Spirit and not in the flesh, not do the desires of the flesh. So the way I like to say it is the difference between a saved person and a lost person is a saved person can't enjoy sin. If you're saved and you sin, you will feel horrible because the Holy Spirit inside will go, Arr! and you'll be grieved. So one way to know if a person's saved or not is whether or not they enjoy sin. If they are out openly sinning and enjoying it, and no guilt, no remorse whatsoever, then they m most likely aren't saved. Because where's the Holy Spirit grieving on the inside? But we have people running around and saying, well, you know, you know, I, I'm saved, but I can do whatever I want. I can do whatever the H-E double hockey sticks I want. That's an interesting attitude, and that, that sounds like somebody that might not be saved. Because when they go do whatever they want, and they don't feel bad about it, it makes me wonder, well, where's the Spirit grieving them? So do you see what the Bible teaches? Grace is not an excuse to sin. We shouldn't say, well, I'm saved by God's grace, so I can do whatever I want. It, that's not what God wants. That's what your flesh wants. But you're not to walk in the flesh, you're to walk in the Spirit. So I'm going to show you some verses here. Now, why am I uh, teaching this? Well, years ago, we were invited to a uh, Christian party. I don't remember if it was Memorial Day or something like that, Veterans Day or something. And there were people that claimed to be Christians, and they invited us over to their party for a barbecue and a grill. And So we went over there, and when we did, we were kind of surprised. My wife and our kids, we were there with all these people that claimed to be believers. They believed that salvation was by grace through faith. And yet they were drinking beer and, and wine and alcohol, and, and I was just kind of uncomfortable. And I told my wife, I said, this, this doesn't feel right. <laughs> I, don't, I don't like this atmosphere. And the man who invited us over in the house that they were having this, he was drunk. He was tipsy. He was three sheets in the wind. He was, I don't know the other vernacular, of, but he was toasted. I mean, he was drunk. And he was a Christian, or he claimed to be. And that always bothered me. Because if he was a Christian, why was he disobeying the Word of God? The Word of God says, Be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. And here this guy claimed to be a Bible believer, yet he wasn't following what the Bible said. So that always bothered me. And that's one of the people that I've seen, and, and there's many others, that had that attitude of, Well, I'm saved. I can do whatever I want. And he did. <laughs> but why wasn't it important to him, to him to do what Jesus wanted? Why was he so comfortable following the sinful flesh and not following the Spirit? It always bothered me. I'm not saying he wasn't saved. He could very well have been saved. I'm not saying he was lost, but he could have been. I'm just saying it was uncomfortable for me 
to see a man claim to be a Christian, and yet he was using grace as an excuse to sin. So let's go to 2 Corinthians. I want to give you as many, many verses as I can from the Bible. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 17. In 2 Corinthians 3.17, the Bible says, Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. You know, there's liberty in Christ. We're no longer under the Old Testament law, we're under grace. So we're under liberty. So people say, well, so I'm under liberty, so guess what? Because I'm under liberty, I can go drink and get drunk. Okay. <laughs> Just because you can do that, uh, should you do that? I think it's a bad testimony myself. But they like to go to the Scriptures and like to say, well, the Scripture says I'm under liberty. Okay, well, let's, let's look at what the Scriptures say if you want to talk about your liberty. Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1 says, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now look at verse 13. For, brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. Uh-oh. That's what they're doing. They're taking the grace of God, and they're saying, well, see, that, that gives me liberty, and they're using that liberty for an occasion to the flesh. And so they're saying, yeah, I'm free. I'm free to do whatever I want. And I'm free, and so I'm free, and I have liberty. I'm going to go get drunk. I'm going to adulterate. I'm going to fornicate. I'm going to lie and steal and chill, because I can do it because I have liberty. You know, I'm like one of these people from the UN. I have diplomatic immunity. I can do whatever I want. Doesn't that sound a little strange to you? That sounds like a very carnal person. And if that person is a Christian and they are saved, then they are a carnal Christian. If they're not saved, well, that, that explains a lot. <laughs> but there are people that, that take grace and they take liberty and they say, liberty is for me an excuse to do whatever I want. You know what? That's not Bible. The Bible tells us the opposite. Use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh. So what is the grace of God for? The grace of God is not so that we can abuse God's grace. The grace of God is so that we can have an opportunity to serve our Savior. I'm going to show you a bunch of verses. Let's go to 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 16. Actually, I'm going to start reading verse 15. 1 Peter 2, 15 and 16. For so is the will of God that with well-doing you may put to silence the ignorance of foolish, ignorance of foolish man. Well-doing. We should do well. We shouldn't do wrong. But many people today that claim to be Christians say, well, now that I'm saved, I can do wrong. Uh, no, we should do well, not do evil. And it says, verse 16, as free. We're free. We have liberty. We have grace. As free, not using your liberty for a cloak of maliciousness, but as the servant, servants of God. Just because you're free and your sins are forgiven and you're in Christ and you have grace and you have liberty does not mean you should use that liberty to be evil. But many say, yeah, but, but you know, I'm saved so I can do whatever I want. But you better watch it. You don't think you'll get away with it, do you? Now, if you are truly saved and you're out sinning, you can't go to hell. I believe in eternal security. I don't believe you can lose salvation. But there are some things you can lose. You can lose your joy. You can lose your rewards in heaven. You can lose your family. You can lose your health. You can lose a lot of things with this attitude that grace is an excuse to sin because the Bible says you reap what you sow. So if you go out there and you're sinning and sinning and sinning, you're going to pay for it in this flesh, in this life, because you will reap what you sow in the flesh. I'm just warning you, don't use grace as an excuse to sin, because that's not what grace is for. It's not an excuse to sin, it's an opportunity to serve. 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 18. 2 Peter 2, 18-20. It's talking about here some false prophets, some evil people. And it says, For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness. See what it is? It's they want. We want this. We want that. They, yeah, I'm saved by grace. That's an excuse for me to do whatever I want, they say. They have much wantonness. Through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. 19, while they promised themselves liberty, they say, well, see, I'm under liberty to do whatever I want. 
They themselves are the servants of corruption. They use liberty or grace as an occasion for the flesh. They use it as an excuse to sin. And you know what? They're in bondage to sin. They let their flesh do whatever it wants. And what are they doing? They're not serving Jesus Christ. It says, and it continues, the servants of corruption, for of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought in bondage. Verse 20, for if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome, the latter end is worse with them than in the beginning. Yeah, yeah, so I've met people like this. I've heard of people like this. I get emails from people that say, hey, Brother Breaker, um, I knew this guy that was a Christian, but he was the worst person I've ever known. <laughs> he was just a horrible person. I didn't even want to be around him. And yet he was a Christian. He was always talking about salvation by grace. Grace through faith. What is that? And I say, well, that's a person that thinks grace is an excuse to sin and they don't read the Bible. How you could think that grace is an excuse to sin and you're a Bible believer and a Berean and a Bible reader, is, is, is it just does not compute. I cannot understand how you could think that's what grace is for. <laughs> grace is to forgive us of all our sins so that we have a clean slate to start serving Jesus. It's not works that saves us, but after we're saved, we ought to live for Jesus. Some people sin more after they're saved than before, <laughs> and that's not the way it should be. Jude, go to the book of Jude, Jude verse 3 and 4. Jude 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. And that's important. We should contend for the faith because we're saved by grace through faith. Faith saves us. Now verse 4 says, For there are certain men crept in unawares. Hmm, okay. Crept in where? Crept into the church. Crept into Christianity. These certain men that have crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation. Now condemnation means damnation. These were people who are condemned. They're bad people. And they come into Christianity. And it says, who are ordained of this condemnation, ungodly men, watch what it says, turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness. So they take God's grace and they twist it. And they don't say, God saves us by His grace and then gives us an opportunity to serve Him as sons. They twist grace. They change it. They turn it into lasciviousness, wantonness. And they say, now that we're saved by grace, we can have orgies. And we can sit around and get drunk together and party and have a good time. And, we can, and they've changed grace from a good thing into a, and, a, and, and giving us an opportunity to do good into saying that grace is now a great opportunity for you to go do whatever you want and do wrong. And denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. These people are evil. They are into lasciviousness, which is vice or wantonness, sin. And they're turning the grace of God into an opportunity to sin. An excuse to do wrong. That's not what it is. That's some very evil people. And they very well could be saved today. There could be people like that that are saved today. And I'll show you here, as we continue our, verse, uh, our, our study here, I will show you what God will do to such people. People that want to live in sin and not serve Jesus are such a poor excuse for a Christian that the Bible says that they're to be offered up to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. Because if they want to live in the flesh and not walk in the Spirit, then God will say, okay, they're such a poor testimony as a Christian, I'll just let the devil take them. And uh, I'll let them reap what they sow. The Bible says there's a sin unto death. There's a sin that a Christian could do that if he does it, God will be so fed up with them, he just says, okay, I'd rather them die and come on home to heaven than to continue living and being a horrible excuse as a Christian. So what does the Bible say about this? Well, let's go to 1 Peter chapter 4. I want to just give you verses and show you that we, when we're saved, we are saved to serve. We are not saved to sin. So we need to live a holy, righteous life and do our best to live holy for Jesus Christ. 1 Peter chapter 4, look at verse 1 through 5. 1 Peter 4, 1 through 5 says, For as much then as Christ hath suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that hath suffered in the flesh hath ceased from sin. What? So we're saved to suffer? <laughs> well, you 
Well, you see, the mentality of people that say grace is an excuse to sin, they say, so I don't have to suffer. I can do whatever I want. I can just party, 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 and have fun. But the Bible says you're saved to serve Jesus, and when you're saved, you're supposed to suffer. Why suffer? Because when you suffer, you don't sin. You realize it's a lot harder to sin when you're suffering? You say, well, what do you mean suffer? Well, the Bible says to put the flesh down, crucify the flesh. Just as Jesus Christ willingly put himself on the cross and crucified his flesh, we are supposed to take up our cross and crucify ourselves spiritually and put down the desires of the flesh. Now, there are good desires of the flesh that aren't sin, and there are those that are bad that are sin. And the ones that are sin, we are not supposed to partake of as Christians. So it says there, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. Verse 2, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh to the lust of men, but to the will of God. So when we're saved, we shouldn't fulfill all the lusts of our flesh. We should say, okay, now that I'm saved by grace, now I need to start living for Jesus and doing his will and live to the will of God. Verse 3, for the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. When we walked in lasciviousness, that means sexual desire, lusts, excess of wine, like that one guy, he was definitely excess of wine, revelings, banquetings, and abominable idolatries. So he lists some things that he said we did before we were saved. What is he insinuating? That now that we're saved, we shouldn't do those things, right? And he says here in verse 4, Wherein they think it strange that you run not with them to the same excess of writing, speaking evil of you. Verse 5, Who shall give account to him that is ready to judge the quick and the dead. Every one of us is going to give account of ourselves to God. I mean, you need to know that. Are you living your life, claiming you're a Christian, just for yourself and just for the flesh? Are you, whether you know it or not, taking God's grace as an excuse to sin? It's not an excuse. There's no excuse. We that are Christians, we should live right and do right and stay away from sin. The book of Romans talks a lot about this. So I want to go through Romans real quick. We'll look at a bunch of verses in Romans. And what the Apostle Paul taught us, because Paul's our Apostle, Paul tells us, do your best to live holy. Don't sin. Don't take the grace of God and then say, well, now that I'm saved, I'll go do whatever I want. No, don't do what you want. Do what God wants. And live for God. Put God first. Take God's grace, not as an excuse to sin, but as an opportunity to suffer for Jesus and serve Him. Because that's what God's grace is for. Romans chapter 6, verse 1 and 2. But what shall we say then? I love these verses here. Apostle Paul says, what shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? <laughs> You see, God's grace saves us from sin. So Paul asked the question, so now that we are sin saved by God's grace, should we continue sinning so that grace may abound? <laughs> should we make God's grace even more grace by sinning even more? Because <laughs> the more we sin, the more God's grace is on us. <laughs> is, that what he, is that what sin is? An excuse, is that what grace is? An excuse to sin? No. What then shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? How does he answer that question? Verse 2, God forbid! God forbid that we go sin just because we can, because we're under grace. God forbid it. He said, God forbid, how shall we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Look there in verse 6. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth we should not serve sin. Paul says dogmatically, we should not serve sin. So, which sounds right? Well, when you get saved, you're under grace, so you can do whatever you want. Does that sound like a biblical statement? No, that's a man-made statement from a really evil person who wants to abuse the grace of God and use it for his flesh. What is the Bible statement? We should not serve sin. So we should serve Jesus Christ. I want to follow the Bible. I'm a real Bible believer. I'm a true, I guess you'd call me a Berean. <laughs> because I search the scriptures. I want to follow what the Bible says. Verses uh, 11 and 12. 
I'm still here in Romans chapter 6, verse 11 and 12. Look at what it says here in Romans uh, 6, verse 11 and 12. Likewise reckon ye also yourselves to be in dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. So we're supposed to be dead to sin. But a lot of people, they say, well, I was never more alive until I got saved because now I can do whatever I want. <laughs> what an opposite extreme of what the Bible teaches. Verse 12, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that you should obey it in the lust thereof. Verse 13, Neither yield ye your members as instruments of right, unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. So let not sin reign. I'm seeing the theme here through Paul's writings. By the way, Paul is the one that God committed the gospel of grace to. So Paul preached grace more than anybody else. Wouldn't you believe it? Wouldn't, wouldn't you understand it? Wouldn't you know that? Would, would you agree with that statement that Paul preached grace more than anybody else? And yet he didn't use grace as an excuse to sin. He preached salvation was by grace, and then he says, Do not let sin reign in you. Be dead to sin. Do not serve sin. Live right. Do right. Don't give in to the flesh. Romans chapter 8, verse 6 and 8. Some people say they follow Paul, and they believe in grace. And yet they twist, and they turn the grace of God into lasciviousness. And they twist it. And they claim to be believers in grace, grace believers. But they use grace as an excuse to sin. What a shame. What a shameful thing. Romans chapter 8, verse 6, For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritual minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they that are in the flesh cannot please God. <laughs> so if you're in the flesh, in the flesh, you can't please God. What does it mean to be in the flesh? Well, the Bible says walk in the Spirit. So as the new creature in Christ, follow the Holy Spirit's guiding and leading inside of you, and the Holy Spirit wants to guide and lead you into good works, into doing right. But a lot of people that claim to be Christians, they would rather follow the flesh and walk in the desires of the flesh. They don't know what it is to suffer, to crucify the flesh. So they say, well, grace is an excuse to sin, so I can do whatever I want. Well, I don't see that in the Bible. Matter of fact, I see the exact opposite. Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Oh, so God says, be holy. Oh, I see. God wants us to live holy. <laughs> Yet these people are given over holy to sin. And yet they're claiming, but I'm under grace, so I can be... So they've got the wrong kind of holy, don't they? They've given themselves holy, W-H-O-L-L-Y, over to sin, and they're not living holy, H-O-L-Y, serving Jesus Christ. It says it's your reasonable service. Verse 2, And be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Let's go to Romans chapter 15. I'm just showing you what the Bible teaches. Amen? Christians are supposed to be holy. They're supposed to be people that are doing right, not out there doing wrong all the time. Grace is not an excuse to sin. It's given to us so that we may serve our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 15, verses 1 through 3. We then ought, that are strong ought to bear the infirmities of the weak and not to please ourselves. Let every one of us please his neighbor for his good to edification. For even Christ pleased not himself, but as it is written, the reproaches of them that reproach thee fell on me. So the problem with many people today that claim to be Christians is they think, well, grace is an excuse for me to go please myself and do whatever I want. They go so far as to say to do whatever the H-E double hockey sticks I want. I've heard them say that. And I just cringe and go, no, no. Do you even read the Bible? You are not saved by grace and given grace so you can go sin. You're given God's grace so that now you can serve Jesus. 
and show others who Jesus is. 1 Corinthians 15. Should a Christian sin? Should a Christian sin? 1 Corinthians 15, 34, the Bible says, Awake to righteousness and sin not. For some have not the knowledge of God. I speak this to your shame. Sin not. Look with me in, in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 26. Ephesians 4, 26. Ephesians 4, 26, notice what it says. Be ye angry and sin not. Let not the sun go down upon your wrath. Again, sin not. 1 John 2, 1. What does 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1 say? 1 John 2, 1 says, My little children, these things write unto you that, that ye sin not. Alright, so don't sin. Three times in the Bible it says sin not. Sin not. Sin not. But if you hang around a certain denomination, a certain group, a certain uh, body of, of the people that call themselves believers for a long enough time, they'll come up to you and say, well, you know, we're under grace, so it's okay, you can do what you want. And, you know, it's okay if you do this, this, or that. We're, we're saved, it doesn't matter. Do whatever you want. They take grace as an excuse for sin. And that's an anti-biblical teaching. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1 through 4. Be therefore followers God as of, of God as dear children. And walk in love as Christ also hath loved us and hath given himself for us, an offering and a sacrifice to God for a sweet-smelling Savior. Verse 3. But fornication and all uncleanliness or covetousness, let it not be named once among you as becometh saints. Don't ever let it be named that a Christian is a fornicator or a covetous person or someone that's unclean, doing unclean practices or evil. Verse 4, neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting, which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. So don't ever let it be named that a Christian did this bad thing and did this sin. But yet Christians, or at least they claim to be, are going around saying, no, grace is an excuse for us to do whatever we want. Now, I told this story before years ago, and I, I need to tell it again. It, it, it illustrates clearly about grace and how when someone shows us grace, it should give us a desire to serve them and love them for what they've given us. I can't remember if it was first grade, second grade, third grade, I don't remember, but back in elementary school, I guess when you get as old as I am, it's all a blur back then. I can't even remember... But I remember when I was in elementary school, I was kind of the runt. I was the smallest kid. I didn't blossom until I was older in life. I was always a scrawny little kid. And I was in this, this class, and all these other kids were probably that much taller than me. And I was the smallest, shortest, littlest kid in the class. And my best friend during that time was a young person who, a young man who had flunked, I think, two times. So he was the tallest person in the class, <laughs> and he had been kept back twice. And he was my best friend, and we sat together, he sat in front of me, and I sat behind him. And when I went to school back in those days, it was still allowed that teachers could spank the children. Now, I know you probably don't believe that, but it's true. I was spanked quite a few times. And in class back then, I remember my friend... I had done something the teacher said not to do, and I don't even remember to this day what it was. But I remember the teacher calling a whole class up front in a line. Now picture this, we're all standing in a line. Here I am, the shortest of all the students. Everybody else is, you know, that much taller than me. And I'm standing next to my best friend, and he's that much taller than all the other students. I mean, what a sight. The smallest kid in the class and the tallest guy in the class. And the teacher had a stick. She had a long wooden dowel. And she said, I've told you all not to do this. And someone's going to get three licks. In those days, when you got a spanking, they called it a lick. And they said, you're going to get three licks. So whoever did this right now, step forward. And when she said that, I knew it was me. And I knew nobody else saw what I did except my friend, who was way taller than me. And I knew I was guilty. I knew that I had committed that horrible, heinous act, and that I deserved punishment. I deserved those three licks. I deserved the chastisement. 
And I remember stepping forward, and I was about to step forward, and when I did, this hand reached out in front of me and pushed me back. I can still feel his hand going like this and pushing me back. And my friend stepped forward, and he said, Teacher, I did it. And I looked at him like, What are you doing? You know I did it. You saw me do it. What are you doing lying and saying... And I looked at him, and he kind of looked back at me and just nodded his head. Or just kind of shook his head like, don't say anything. And I watched the teacher bend him over a desk and give him my three licks. They were meant for me. They were my licks. And that teacher spanked him for something that I did. And when that happened, I remember little te tears welling up in my eyes. And I remember thinking, wow, why did you do that for me? So we all sat back down, and then I asked him later, I said, why'd you do that? Why would you do that? You knew that I was guilty, and that I deserved that spanking. Why would you do that for me? He looked at me, and he says, well, you're the smallest one in class, and I'm the biggest one in class. He says, I know you couldn't take it, and I know that I was bigger, and it wouldn't hurt me as much, so I took it for you. Whew. You know what that is? That's That's grace. <laughs> And you know what that taught me? You know what that instilled in me? I didn't look at that as, well, that means I can do whatever I want. And he's always going to take it for me. I never, that thought never entered into my mind. All that entered into my mind was what love, what grace he had for me. And it made me love him more. And it made me want to serve him. The whole rest of that year, if he came to class without a pencil, hey, take mine. Whatever you need, man, I'm here for you. I love you because you did that for me. Sometimes he'd come to class and didn't have any paper. Here, take some paper. Here, take the whole notebook. Hey, for what you did for me that time, man, whatever you want, it's yours. I'm going to serve you because what you did for me, I didn't deserve. And you put that into the Bible. You put that into salvation. You look at Jesus Christ. He died in my place. For my sins, he took my licks that I deserved. When I look at Jesus Christ and his grace and dying in my place for my sins, I don't say, wow, now I can abuse that and now I can go do whatever I want. I look at what Jesus Christ did for me and I say, wow, whatever you want, Jesus. That should have been me on that cross. That should have been me dying and suffering the pain and the anguish and the bloodshed. But you did it in my place. Whatever you want, God, I'll serve you. Do you see what salvation should breed inside of a person? Salvation should breed gratitude, thankfulness, joy, love, and a desire to serve Him who died for you. I don't understand this mentality that grace, well, I'm saved by grace, so now I can go sin. I don't understand that. Because I see Jesus for what He is. My suffering substitute in my place for my sins. And it makes me love Him and want to serve Him with all my heart. I don't see grace as an excuse for sin. 2 Timothy, please. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 19. I love this verse here. I'm going to read 2 Timothy 2.19. Then I'm going to read all the way down to verse 22. This is what God wants from us that are saved. 2 Timothy 2.19 Nevertheless the foundation of God standeth sure, having this seal that the Lord knoweth them that are His. Now verse, the next part of the verse, verse 19, is for Christians. And let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from iniquity. What are we that are Christians supposed to do? We're not supposed to look at God's grace as an excuse to sin. We're supposed to look at God's grace and say, wow, He saved me. He took what I deserved. I deserve punishment. I deserve hell. He took my sin. And that should make me want to depart from sin. In thankfulness for what He did for me. Let everyone that nameth the name of Christ depart from sin. Now verse 20, But in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and earth, and some of honor and some to dishonor. Yeah. There's some Christians that I would call honorable Christians because they understand this and they try to live a good life and serve Jesus. Then there are some Christians that are dishonorable. They look at grace as an excuse to sin and they do wrong. 
Verse 21, If a man therefore purge himself of these, he shall be a vessel unto honor, sanctified and meet for the master's use, and prepared unto every good work. Verse 22, Flee also youthful lust, but follow after righteousness, faith, charity, peace, with them that call upon the Lord, or call on the Lord, out of a pure heart. What does God want from us? He wants us to be a clean vessel. He wants us to depart from iniquity. He wants us to live above reproach, to live a holy life and sin not, not walk in the flesh, but to try to please God. We should not serve sin, not let sin reign in our mortal bodies. We should be dead to sin. We should do everything we can to serve Jesus out of love for what He's done for us. Well, in this message I've showed you why we should serve Jesus. It's number one because we're commanded to. I've read so many verses commanding us as Christians to do everything we can to keep from sinning, to stay away from sin, and to live a holy life. Why do we serve Jesus? Number two, because it shows you love Jesus. Just as I was so thankful to that young man who took my licks in my place and it made me want to serve him. Same with Jesus. I want to serve him because he took my punishment for my sin. And the last thing I want to say is the reason we as Christians should live a holy life and do right is because we can get rewards in heaven for our service for Jesus Christ. These people that run around and say, well, grace is an, ex is an excuse to sin, and, and you know, uh, I'm saved now so I can do whatever the H-E double hockey sticks I want. Those people that have that mentality that salvation is so I can go sin, they're losing out. They're losing out. And guess what they're losing? Rewards in heaven. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 23 says, Servants, obey in all things your masters according to the flesh, not with eye service as men pleasers, but in singleness of heart, fearing God. Verse 23, And whatsoever ye do, do heartily. Do it heartily as to the Lord and not unto man. Whatever you do, do for Jesus. Don't do for yourself. Verse 24, Knowing that of the Lord you shall receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. There's a reward that God offers in heaven. What is that reward? Well, whatever you do for Jesus, you'll be rewarded for at the uh, judgment seat of Christ. Verse 25, But he that doeth wrong shall receive for the wrong which he hath done, and there is no respect of, of persons. These people that have the idea that, well, now that I'm saved, I can do whatever I want. That means I can do wrong, and I can enjoy it. <laughs> Boy, are they missing out. Imagine them getting to heaven and finding out they have no rewards for all eternity. Just standing before God with nothing but a white robe. Looking around at all these other Christians and they have, you know, medals here and crowns here and gold and silver in their hands. Rewards for serving Jesus. And they got nothing. Why? Because they chose to follow the flesh down here and not suffer in the spirit. So they didn't get any rewards in heaven. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. Now he that planteth and he that watereth are one, and every man shall receive his own reward according to his own labor. What you do for Jesus Christ, he will reward you for in heaven. So if you choose not to get those rewards and you just want to use grace as an excuse to sin, then your reward will be down here. You'll have nothing up there if you're saved. Verse 14, if any man's work abide which he hath built thereon, he shall receive a reward. Second John, Second John 1 John 1.18. Second John 1 8 says. Second John 1 8, I'm sorry. Second John 1 8. Look to yourselves that you lose not those things which we have wrought, but that we receive a full reward. You know what I want as a Christian? I want a full reward. I want to get to heaven and hear Jesus Christ say, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. I want to hear Jesus say, Here you go, Robert. Here are the, the rewards. Because you suffered for me. You served me. You, you put down the desires of the flesh. You tried to live a holy life. You tried to do what I wanted you to do. You tried to depart from iniquity and live a good life. You preached the gospel. You went to a foreign mission field and suffered for, for many years and got sick and were robbed and, and held at gunpoint. And, and you did these things for me to show me that you love me. You didn't look at my grace as an excuse to sin. You looked at it as an opportunity to serve 
And that's what you did. I'm going to close with Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3, and I want to read verses 3 through 8. But I hope you get the gist of this message. Salvation is not an excuse to sin. When we're saved, we have a great opportunity to show Jesus how much we love Him. And we can show Him how much we love Him by what we do for Him. Titus chapter 3, verse 3, For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. Verse 4, But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared. Verse 5, Not by the works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy He saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior. That being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. We're saved, we're justified by grace, through faith. Now verse 8, this is a faithful saying, and these things I will that thou affirm constantly, that they which have believed in God might be careful to maintain good works. These things are good and profitable unto men. Why does God give us His grace? It's so that we can get saved. Now do you think God likes it that when we get saved, that then we go and we live in the flesh and do whatever we want? Or do you think God wants us, when we get saved, to do right and to serve Him? Well, I think this message has spoken for itself. Yet I still know people that claim to be Christians. And they preach on grace a lot, and that's great. There's nothing wrong with grace. I love the grace of God. But they go to the extreme with grace. And they say, well, grace is... Now that I'm saved by grace, I can do whatever I want. Is that really what the Bible teaches? You know, what about what God wants? Did you ever think that what God wants is for you to quit sinning and to give Him a little of your time and attention? Show Him your love, serve Him, and not abuse the grace that He's given you? Grace, not an excuse to sin. Thank you for watching this. We'll see you next week. God bless.